So that's a bit of background in terms of what I'm talking about regarding convergence. I also am uh, posting to the site a, um, a TED Talk that deals with this same issue. And what I want to do in the last few minutes of this lecture is just give some of the background of the law that, that we'll be looking at in this module and that uh, relates to this question of convergence. And, you know, one way you can conceive of all this and that I think is a, a useful paradigm is you can, in terms of the law, is that it is a communications law issue and an intellectual property law issue. There are other areas of law, law too, of course, commercial law and contract law and, and so on. But these are the two that I, I think for our topic that I want to focus on. Communications law and intellectual property law, and in particular, how do communications law and intellectual property law themselves converge? How do they interface with each other? Um, what are the areas of, of tension? What are the places where that interface is um, smoother or less smooth? So I just, in these next couple of slides, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on communication law, very, very brief, and a little bit, again, very brief background on intellectual property law. I know some of you will have had intellectual property law classes. Some of you um, won't have had them. You'll have had a little bit of it in the Internet Law module, but we'll talk about it a bit here. So first, uh, let's talk a little bit about communication law. So what is communication law all about? I think you can break it up into a number of broad areas of concern. One area of concern historically has been the allocation of spectrum. So if you think about communications law historically as really first dealing with radio, broadcast radio, um, and then dealing with broadcast television. These are all analog era, pre-digital era um, kinds of technologies. And when you have a, a non-digital technology, certainly with, with things like the radio spectrum, you only have a certain amount of bandwidth. You have a, a, a limited amount of bandwidth. Uh, and not only do you have a limited amount of bandwidth, but if you are broadcasting a signal on a certain frequency, uh, and that is in geographic proximity to someone else broadcasting a signal on that same frequency or a nearby frequency, there's the potential for interference. And you've probably experienced this if you've listened to you know broadcast radio um, driving across states or something like that where you're listening to your favorite station and you begin to get a little bit out of range and then you begin to pick up a little bit of another station that might be um, at the same place or a, or a similar similar place on the dial and you start to get interference well this uh, you know again with something like radio can still be a real concern uh, and it was a very significant concern early on with radio and television. And if you think about this further, you know, you, you've got to have some kind of system to avoid interference of saying, well, you know, this station or this broadcasting entity gets this piece of, of the spectrum. Um, this entity gets the next piece of the spectrum. Um, and you know, if you're going to try to allocate that, you've got to find, figure out, well, how are we going to do that? Now, you know, with real property, you can allocate those kinds of rights um, by setting up fences um, and literally physically excluding somebody. Um, um, and, you know, ultimately you can resort to force, but in terms of the rule of law, you can, you know, have a system of uh, creating a deed and creating boundaries of, of property rights and recording the deeds and uh, having you know the, the the sheriff come in if someone has has trespassed and 
looking at the deeds and, and so on. Um, and it's, it's kind of tangible and obvious because, you know, you're standing on this piece of land and you can put down surveyor's marks. Well, you could do spectrum the same way. You could just say there's some kind of way in which somebody puts up a fence around the spectrum. They claim it. They have some uh, historic or prior claim to it. Maybe there's a, uh, you kind of stake out your rights as a squatter or something like that. And then you begin to build fences around it. But it's much more difficult to do that. I think you can see as a practical matter, um, it's relatively easy if you have broadcasting equipment to interfere with somebody's signal, and it's relatively hard um, to police those boundaries, or at least a little bit harder. And it's also difficult to decide, well, who gets the first right? I mean, real property law has very deep roots in the common law uh, and very historic roots, and so there's sort of a social acceptance um, at least in sort of constitutional, you know, broadly free market-based democracies, there's a kind of social acceptance of the idea that, well, there are these historic property rights. Somebody has had ownership going back, and we trace that, and we, we don't really raise, in, mo in many cases, we don't really raise too much question about it. We might raise questions, you know, if it's, um, let's say it's a Native American land claim or something like that, right? we'll raise questions. But, but often we we kind of just accept it. Well, how do you do that with something new like broadcast spectrum? Uh, and so that's part of the area of communications law. There are different ways that, that it's done um, and has been done. You know, there have been auctions that have set up. There are um, uh, qualifications to prove that you've got actually the capacity to operate effectively in a market and broadly speaking for the public interest. In order to get spectrum. So that would be one area of concern. As we talk about the internet, um, that is a different kind of concern. Of course, just given the laws of the physics um, and the kind of capacity of the cables and routers and switches that carry internet traffic, internet bandwidth is not unlimited either. Um, but the amount of available bandwidth and the ability to create patch, packet switched traffic without the same kind of interference is a very different kind of proposition than something like over the air broadcasts but it's something that, that communications law thinks about um, a related piece of this is market regulation so let's say we've allocated spectrum if that's something we have to do. And then we might decide, well, since this there's some kind of government grant being given here to someone, a license to use this spectrum, is there anything we want to want to require? Do we want to say that, well, you can't only carry political advertising from one side of the aisle? There's some kind of fairness rule, perhaps. Um, are there certain kinds of signals that you, you are obligated to retransmit um, and not block? Um, are there interconnections that you're obligated to make with other providers and other geographic locations? How do we deal with the infrastructure, the physical infrastructure you have to create? So when you get into something like uh, telephone communications, for example, because you know, radio is an area, telephone is an area, television is an area, um, and eventually cable television will be an area. How do you attach those wires to poles in a local municipality? How do you get a right of way to do that, right? All those kinds of things, that piece of infrastructure, part of communications law, broadly speaking. What about content? Again, you're giving some kind of government grant or license. Um, the First Amendment presumably applies, but what are the limits? Is Are there going to be rules about obscenity? Um, are there going to be rules about whether certain kinds of programming uh, is 
accessible in a local area. For example, rules about you know sports team blackouts. Um, are there going to be rules about having to carry certain kinds of local programming? You may notice uh, if you have cable television, somewhere on your, your dial there's going to be a public access channel, and you probably have some um, you know some guy from your city or your local area or something like that, you know, cooking Italian food or something with really, really bad sound and video quality. Or maybe your local school, my, my local school in my town, the kids put on a uh, broadcast about things that are going on in, in the school. How does that get on TV? It's because historically cable television have local access carriage requirements uh, and they have to allocate certain and channels for for local programming. So you, are you going to have rules like that or not? Those all those sorts of things are part of communication law. What about market access? Now, you know, again, we're looking at a resource. If we're talking about spectrum, we're looking at, at a resource that is scarce. If we're talking about uh, certain kinds of infrastructure, uh, you know, let's say telephone lines. Again, you're talking about a resource that has some degree of scarcity. Um, and when there's scarcity and there's the possibility of one or a few entities controlling that scarcity, you have the potential for market failures. You have the potential for monopolization or um, anti-competitive oligopolies. So what do you do about that? Do you have rules that specify when and under what circumstances there can be a new entrant? Um, how does somebody new get into the game? That's always a big question uh, in competition law and policy. And then you might have things like, you know, again, if you've got infrastructure that's going through state and local areas, um, or you've uh, simply got transmission that are going in and through state and local areas. Can the state and local area uh, charge a franchise fee, a tariff, some other kinds of tax? And how does that, how does that work? Um, so all those kinds of things could be part of, or, or are you going to prohibit that kind of thing and have a national policy that says there are no state and local fees? You know, how do you do that? That's all part of communication law. And then you have concerns about cons Consumer protection. Uh, what about rate regulation? Uh, you're giving a license. There are certain um, bits of infrastructure. There's going to. It's not going to be kind of just likely not going to be just normal competition, uh, where it's relatively easy for a new entrant to come in and compete on price or quality or service or something like that. Um, and if that's going to be the case, should there be caps on the rates that are charged to consumers? Should there be procedures through which uh, uh, rates are, are determined? A very good analogy here is another really important area of highly regulated public infrastructure, which is energy. So um, in the United States, we have a significant amount of energy regulation there was a period in which energy was um, significantly de deregulated. Um, it is, to a significant extent, deregulated today. But nevertheless, there's a lot of uh, regulation and con control, or at least um, limits, over things like the rates the utility company can charge to individual um, consumers. Uh, what about access to people with disabilities? What about uh, who's going to regulate the possibility of mergers um, and acquisitions, especially, again, on the antitrust front as the industry potentially can consolidate? All of these sorts of things are areas that, broadly speaking, communications law deals with. In the United States, there are a number of statutes that are kind of the foundation for our national communications law policy um, and that are you know, still broadly applicable today. One is the Communications Act of 1934, 
So the Communications Act of 1934, as you might gather, um, initially is broadly concerned with uh, radio broadcast. And in the, the Communications of Act of 1934, the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, was established. So the FCC, of course, is the regulatory, uh, the federal regulatory body that is making rules and doing enforcement, and that is um, absolutely central to communications policy in the United States today. We saw a little bit of that in our internet law module, of course, in the debate over network neutrality, um, through which the FCC is um, regulating certain aspects of internet commerce and effectively is arguing that um, the internet, the World Wide Web, is part of this kinds of communication infrastructure like broadcast television or radio or telephones and so on, and that's part of that big debate. The, the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, or CALEA, involves the ability of uh, law enforcement to obtain certain kinds of information uh, from certain information providers like telephone companies um, you know can the can the FBI plant a trace device on a telephone line in order to figure out numbers that are being dialed um, can the uh, FBI get from the telephone company subscriber information those sorts of things um, covered by Kalia. Uh, if you take the computer crime and or the national security modules in my internet law sequence, we'll talk a little bit more about Kalia, but we'll also talk about the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. So the ECPA is kind of like, in a way, Kalia for email. Um, and there are huge debates today about the applicability of the ECPA to cloud providers and jurisdictional questions and so on. Um, the Cable Communications Act of 1984, the Satellite Home Viewer Act, obviously these are statutes that are dealing with uh, the development of the cable and satellite television industry. Uh, and likewise, the Cable Television Consumer Protection and Competition Act and then the Telecommunications Act of 1996. So the Telecom Act of 1996 is really um, a, a, certain, a significant overhaul of, of the 1934 Communications Act. And it's the 1996 Communications Act that has these different um, classifications of things in terms of a communication or information service, and that is taken up in the FCC's open internet order and was the subject of the case in the DC circuit that we looked at in the internet law class. There are also various state and local laws and rules that relate to communication law. And, you know, if you think about it a little bit, because communication law involves infrastructure resources like poles and wires uh, that have to go through local areas, there's got to be some kind of overlap between the state and local rules and these federal rules. 